Welcome. We're very glad that you're present today to be a part of our Zoom conference. This is the listening session with paraeducators, and we're delighted to have you here today. And we look forward to hearing from you and our presenters today on the paraeducator certificate program training and the impacts for COVID-19 on your role and engagement with students, teachers, and your community. My name is Janelle Adams, and I am a consultant to the Professional Educator Standards Board, and I'll be facilitating today's session. We are presenting on Zoom today, and if you have any technical difficulties, please consult the Zoom Help Center at support.zoom.us. Here's our agenda for today. And after some brief introductions, we will start our program with an overview of the paraeducator board and the paraeducator certificate program. We're also going to be hearing today some presentation and some comments from paraeducators who have volunteered all over the state to represent their district to talk about their experiences in both training and in their role in the COVID-19 era. Their presentations will provide an insight on their experiences with the paraeducator training program and the impact that COVID-19 has had on their role. We will then close with some comments today from our visiting legislators who, have, who are in attendance and a review of the paraeducator board's legislative request for the upcoming session. So it's my pleasure to begin our session with introductions. And I welcome Alexandra Manuel, who is the Executive Director of the Professional Educator Standards Board. Alex? Thank you, Janelle. Um, thanks so much um, for uh, facilitating and, and leaving with us today. I'd like to um, first uh, thank all of our board members that are joining us as participants for tonight's discussion. Um, Kathy Smith, our Chair of the Paraeducator Board, Lauren Sickles, our vice chair of the paraeducator board. Uh, Laura Rogers, uh, an ELL paraeducator in our Everett um, School District. And Lizzie Sebring, um, also a member of our paraeducator board um, from the Everett School District um, and a member uh, representing the PTA. Next slide. I'd also like to thank um, our staff team, um, many of whom will be presenters um, and facilitators this evening. Thank you for your planning efforts and coordination. Um, you'll be hearing from Jack Busby, our Associate Director for Educator Pathways and the Paraeducator Board, from Marie Sullivan, who is um, working with us around government relations. Um, you've heard already from Janelle, um, who's consulting with us. Uh, Zoe is our Program Specialist um, and will be uh, helping with many of the technical aspects of tonight as well um, as sending out many messages to all of you. Um, Stacy, our program manager for Educator Pathways, and Aaron Peck, our communications uh, manager. And thank you to all of you um, for your support. Next slide. I'd also like to recognize um, and acknowledge the legislators that have registered um, to attend tonight. Thank you for taking the time. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have Lisa Callen uh, joining us this evening. Uh, Mia, Representative Mia Gregerson, uh, Representative Sharon Tomiko Santos. Uh, we have Senator uh, Mona Doss. Um, we have Senator Sam Hunt. And we also have Senator Claire Wilson joining us. So thank you so much for taking the time this evening. And we look forward to hearing from you later. And finally, um, before we um, switch over, we'd like to thank um, all of our participants, we appreciate your engagement in the listening session today um, and really look forward to our, our conversations together. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kathy Smith, our chair um, of the paraeducator board to further share the purpose of our listening session this evening. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the first listening session with paraeducators. I'm Kathy Smith and I am chair of the paraeducator board, which is administered by the Professional Educator Standards Board. I'm looking forward to listening and speaking with all of you today. Thank you for joining us. 
The purpose of this listening session is to hear from paraeducators. Never has there been a time of change so dramatic to a paraeducator's job as during these COVID times. Paraeducators are working with students online, in schools, and from their homes. We're hearing from paraeducators educating in so many different ways with our students and families. This afternoon, we'd like to hear about your experiences, how training has helped you improve your skills and knowledge. What additional trainings do you need to help you support your students' academic goals and their social and emotional wellness? We also know that families have become an even more important partner in remote learning. So we're looking forward to hearing your stories about how your roles and responsibilities have stretched in the past nine months. So just please share your thoughts and questions in the Q&A box on Zoom or the comment box on Facebook. And if you think of something you'd like to share after the listening session, please email your comments to the Paraeducator Board's public comment email address. We look at all those public comments before every board meeting. Um, you'll find instructions on the PESB website. So thank you so much and thank you for joining us. Now I'd like to turn this over to Laura Rogers, a member of our Paraeducator Board. As we gather, as we all gather today, let's acknowledge that no matter where we are zooming in from, we are all on the traditional land of Native Americans. Their ancestors were the original inhabitants of the land we, were, we are occupying today. As we proceed with our work, let's make sure that our deliberations and recommendations benefit their descendants equitably. We would like to start our meeting with a land acknowledgement recognizing the indigenous people who have historically been moved from their homelands and territories. The United States sees more than 1.5 billion acres from indigenous people between 1776 and 1887. But today, most of that land is held in trust by the government, severely restricting the rights of Native American people. It is important to note on this map that you do not see the Duwamish, Wanapum and Chinook tribes, who are not recognized by the US federal government, but should be acknowledged as they have had a long history in present day Washington. Recognizing the original inhabitants of the spaces we occupy through awareness building and land acknowledgement practices is an important step toward advancing equity in education and beyond. Wherever you are virtually in Washington state, please take a few seconds to acknowledge the land that you are on as the traditional homeland of the indigenous peoples. I'd like to turn this over to Lizzie Sebring, a member of the Paraeducator Board. Thank you, Laura. We would like to acknowledge the history of this nation, one fraught with contradictions. For too long, this country has elevated a story of democracy and freedom while minimizing the impact of violence and oppression on marginalized communities, communities whose backs this nation was built. Today, members of our black community and other communities of color continue to experience racism through pr police brutality, mass incarceration, inequitable education and health services, deportation and other forms of subjugation. We aim to disrupt the legacy of systemic racism by centering racial equity and justice in our work. This is how we stand with our communities of color. Before we begin, we want to offer a moment of silence to consider these words and how you might join us in this work. And now I'm going to turn this over to Lauren. Sorry about that. Helps if I hit the unmute button. Thank you, Lizzie. The Washington Paraeducator Board was created in 2017 and has the following powers and duties. 
adopt paraeducator minimum employment requirements and standards of practice, establish requirements and policies for a paraeducator certificate program, and make policy recommendations for a paraeducator career ladder. The membership of the board includes four paraeducators, one who also represents the Washington State PTA, as well as representatives for teachers, administrators, higher education institutions, and OSPI. The paraeducator certificate program offers statewide standards-based training for all paraeducators and supports a career growth ladder for those who wish to advance their profession as a paraeducator or pursue a role in teaching. The program is made up of the fundamental course of study and four certificates, the general paraeducator certificate, ELL and special education subject matter certificates, and the advanced paraeducator certificate. Paraeducators are familiar with the fundamental course of study, which is a district delivered 28 hours of professional development. Half of the required training took place during the 2019-20 school year, and half, the second half is taking place this school year. This is the first time that the state has funded statewide training for all paraeducators, and it emphasizes the importance of the paraeducator role and the impact our profession has on student growth and well being. We look forward to hearing from our paraeducator community and the impacts of the paraeducator training on your professional experience supporting teachers with student instruction. Training on the para general paraeducator certificate, if funded by the legislature, like funded by the legislature, will begin during the 2021-22 school year. The paraeducator board is requesting that the legislator continue to fund the professionalization of Washington paraeducators by funding this training. We will share more about our request at the end of the listening session. Now I'd like to bring Jack in to give us some norms. Thank you, Lauren. For the, thank you, Lauren, for the overview of the paraeducator board and the training requirements. Before we open the conversation, we want to share with the community the process for submitting comments or questions and a few norms. To begin, the listening session is live and being recorded. The board looks forward to you sharing your open and forthright thoughts on the required paraeducator training and the impacts of COVID-19 on your engagement with your students. Please note that the board cannot address local employment decisions. As you hear from our speakers today, who are all paraeducators throughout the state, please listen to understand what they are sharing. They will all share their experience with the training and impact of COVID-19. You may find their stories to resonate with your own, or you may find it to be completely different. This is an opportunity to hear from others and share your thoughts with the board. We are using Zoom to host the listening session. Those interested in sharing their thoughts with the board, please use the Zoom Q&A box. Note you will only see the comments or questions that you submit. Staff will receive all feedback and will summarize similar comments or share one comment that aligns with several. As we do not anticipate being able to address all feedback during the session, consider completing the paraeducator survey or submitting public comment. If you're reviewing the listening session on Facebook, please use the comment box. Thank you, and we look forward to starting the event. Janelle. Thanks, Jack. So now is the opportunity that we're going to be hearing from um, some volunteers who have uh, submitted some of their comments and said that they would be available today to talk with everybody on our listening session. So we will be having two sections. Today we're going to we will have eight paraeducators that will share their thoughts on the training and the impact of COVID-19 on their role and their engagement with their students, teachers, and communities. The eight presenters did respond to our open invitation from PESB and, uh, several weeks ago, and so we're delighted that they confirmed and will be able to share their thoughts to kind of kick off our session this, this evening. So in the first section, we're going to have four paraeducators who will share their experiences with the training. Our part one is all about the training that we, they have received and to what extent are they using it and applying it in their classroom for student success. 
Each of these particular paraeducators will have two minutes to share their feedback to the board. And then we will open it up for a conversation with the board. In our second session, two paraeducators <sighs> will continue and they will have eight minutes to go into detail about the impact about their roles during COVID-19 and some of their appro innovative approaches that their school districts have taken to expand the role of the paraeducator. Then in our final section, we'll end with four paraeducators, two will be returning, and they will show the impacts of their jobs during COVID-19, and they will have two minutes to, to share. And so during their sharing time, we encourage the paraeducators who are attending this Zoom, our webinar, from the field to start thinking about and writing in their comments at the question and answer section. So uh, we are excited to hear from our paraeducators. So the next slide. So here are the questions that our paraeducators that volunteer will be covering. The first question is, what is the value of the training that you received? And question number two, how are you applying the training with your students and colleagues? So as you hear from our first four paraeducators, those of you in the field, we'd like you to be answering the same questions in the Q&A box. And so that way, Jack and Zoe will be able to look at the comments across the state that we're receiving and then we'll have an opportunity to hear what you're all committing to and talking about around training and how you're applying that. So we're now ready to go to our guest paraeducators. And I believe that Jack is going to introduce the four paraeducators that will be speaking. Great, thank you, Janelle. Uh, first up, we have Deborah Travis. Deborah, are you with us? I am present. Great. Thank you so much, Deborah. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Um, like you said, my name is Deborah Travis. I'm a paraeducator in Eastern Washington with the Yakima School District working at Garfield Elementary School. So, as to the question of the value of my certification training, you know, the first thing I thought about is how do you put a value on human connections? Because for me, that is what this provide this this training has helped provide. Um, and the ways it has provided that is through a greater understanding of hu of child development, as well as how working has uh, working as a team with the other staff members in my school presuming positive intention. These things are things that I had not um, considered um, prior. And, and my biggest, um, I think, thing that I liked about the training was the social emotional learning. Understanding not only the development of our students, but also in these crazy times, the social and emotional considerations that goes along with that. And I apply it every day in my small groups I apply it every day in my small groups and um, and uh, sorry, I'm looking at how much time I have left. Not very much time, sorry about that. And the technology simply, you know, when, when the school shut down, how do we connect with our kids? You know, that was the big question. How do we connect with our kids? And so the tr also the training that we were provided as far as um, technical training, how to, how to um, reach out and connect with those kids um, was extremely valuable. But working as a team, I have found out um, different things, open-mindedness. You know, a lot of the teachers when we first started out uh, were, um, I'm sure they had kind of their ways set. And with this COVID thing hit, any of the training that, um, any of the training that uh, that we received um, helped everybody do their job so much better. So for me, it's those human, the, the training is providing me with better human connection through my meets, Google meets with my students, as well as meets with the other, with the other um, teachers and how do we develop relationships with each other, 
keeping our students' interest in mind. So I think I'm going to stop there. I'm not sure the timer was working, and that kind of threw me off. Sorry about that. I hope I didn't go over my time, but uh, that is uh, that's how technology, how I'm using the technology, the training that was provided for me. Thank you very much. Excellent, Deborah. Thank you so much. And now we're going to go to our next presenter. And I have Katie Lee on my agenda, but I don't know. There yep, she is. That's right. We have Katie Lee. Um, Deborah, thank you for that. I had it on two hours, not two minutes. You would have had plenty of time to talk there if we actually went through the whole timer. Uh, Katie Lee, um, are, are you with us? Yes, I am here. Great. Thank you. Um, your floor. Thank you. So like uh, Jack said, I'm Katie Lee, Regional Classified Employee of the Year 2020, Vinland Elementary ISP paraeducator for the last 14 years in the North Kitsap School District Olympic ESD 114. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. What is the value of the training that I have received? I feel that um, I'm very pleased with the training that we have received this year. We've done some SIPS training on how to help kids with um, reading issues and dyslexia issues. Uh, I have a very good understanding on how to Zoom and to use Seesaw, uploading assignments for students to help with their goals. Um, I use Zoom every day throughout my day, uh, helping kids that are struggling on their Seesaw assignments. Um, we work together on IEP goals. I also help monitor behavior and I have learned adequate uh, data recording skills. We had a nice session on how to properly record data for the students that we're working on. I value the the training that we've gotten this year tremendously. It feels so good to be part of the bigger picture, to actually hear our voices and know that what we're doing is putting a positive impact towards our students. And it is allowing open communication, which helps everyone. Uh, it looks like I am out of time. So thank you so much for allowing me to have a moment of your time. Thank you so much. All right, Janelle, it looks like we have Donna Hansen next. Okay, great. Hey. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, I'm Donna Hansen. I'm the library technician at Yale Middle School in Yelm, Washington. And I wanna talk about uh, our training. Um, our initial training was back in August of 2019 for our first part of the fundamental course of study. They put over a hundred of us in a gym and had a team of trainers from our teaching and learning department instructing us. It sounds terrible, but the training was actually really engaging. They used discourse, collaboration, reading and writing. They did a great job of making it relevant and it kind of made it fun. And we then had the online Moodles that we did training through OSPI during the spring closure. It was also very good. And then we had ELL and the SPED modules. The servers were a little stressed out and we had some major server errors. But with a lot of patience, almost all of the pairs in my district were able to complete the 40 clock hours of training. With the expectation now that we have to get 70 clock hours within three years after completing our fundamental course of study, our district has stepped up now. We're getting training on every half day. They're gearing it towards distance learning right now with the social emotional learning as well. It's been very good. I'm just beginning my 28th year in my district. I've had more training in the last year and a half than all of my previous years combined. The training we had previously was mostly given by our insurance carrier and was good as more geared toward what do we need to do to keep our jobs and keep from being sued. Any training that we would direct that would directly help us in our jobs was usually after hours and only on a volunteer basis with no compensation or it was training that we had to beg for and fight to get. With the offerings we're now getting, I now feel far more valued and a real part of the educational team. No more being thrown to the wolves and hope it works out. That's 
the value of the training. Applying the training, I run the parent help desk during the online learning and the training in Google Classroom, Zoom, and Screencastify has been extremely valuable and pertinent. I make videos to post on my library page for parents and students to use. I can see in my mind's eye what students are doing on their screen and, this, and then I can walk them through um, the steps that they need to do to be successful. I can have them share their screen with me as well and help them get their work done. I also tutor a student in a home hospital situation and the trainer has helped me help her to be very successful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. Ken Norton, are you with us? I'm here, Jack. Thank you, it's your floor. Thank you, Jack. My name is Ken Norton. I'm a special education paraeducator in the Chuck Willis School District. I teach at Cascade View Elementary School. I've been in special education for about eight years. My colleagues and I have varied educational backgrounds and life experiences. We are not in education to get rich. We are in education to make a difference in the lives of children, youth, and families. The training that we have been receiving has been very helpful in our work with our students. It would be helpful if we had more time in our training sessions to apply our learnings. I am blessed to work in the Tuckwilla School District as our staff at Cascade View work together for the good of our students. Our students know that all the adults at Cascade View are their teachers. With the onset of the COVID-19, our roles have changed as we work as a team to facilitate our students' learning using many new technologies for distance learning. Since March 13th, 2020, We've been reaching out to our families to ascertain their needs during this unprecedented time in our lives. We have found that some of our families were in need of internet connections, computers, food, and other basic necessities. We as a team have enlisted outside resources to be of help to our families. The main reason for the outreach to our families is to eliminate any potential barriers to the students learning. Since we have been dealing with the use of various technologies in the last eight to nine months, our training a week ago addressed technology platforms that we as a team are using on a regular basis. Thank you for listening to my thoughts today. I encourage you to continue to support the paraeducator training in the state of Washington. The training has made a difference in our lives and that of our students. Thank you. Great. Well, I want to thank all of our four paraeducators for stepping up to the plate and giving us a great opportunity to look into their experiences and how they valued the training that they received and how they're applying it. I, I think I'm always amazed at the resilience and the willingness of our paraeducator staff to step up to the plate and really provide the services to our students. So now I'd like to open it up to the board to uh, talk a little about what they've heard and any questions that they might have for our four paraeducator presenters on the topic of training. So let me um, look out to my board members and see who would like to respond first. Lauren? Thank you, Janelle. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I One a common thing I I think I heard from most of you, if not all of you, was just uh, sounded like a sense of feeling like you were being part of a bigger, uh, being brought into part or being part of the bigger uh, organization. Again, I'm sorry, loss of words there for a moment. Um, I'm curious if when you guys were receiving your training, what, how many of you? was that were involved with teachers alongside in the training because I've heard some some accounts of that taking place out in the field. Okay, let's ask our um, paraeducators if any of you would like to unmute and share your thoughts to Lauren. I'm Deborah Travis, and Lauren, thank you for the question. Um, we did not get our certification training until after COVID hit. It was in March before we received it, so we were online, so we did it on an individual basis. Originally, it was set for the beginning of the school year, but that got canceled for some reason, and then they pushed it off 
to the point where we had to go online. So we, we did it individually on our own, unfortunately. Okay, thank you very much for that. Other responses to Lauren? Yes, Janelle, this is Ken Norton speaking. Thank you okay. for the question, Lauren. Uh, the previous school year, 19 and, 19, 19 and 20, it was strictly um, classified uh, pair educators. But this last, about a week ago, like I said, we did technology training. And we had a lot of our certificated colleagues there. And it was really awesome when we, when we had everyone together. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you, Janelle. Okay. Hi, this uh, is Donna Hansen. Hi, Donna. Go ahead. Great question. Um, I'm currently doing the Kickstarter program through our ESD 113, and it is a um, cohorts, and the cohorts are filled with certificated administrators and classified staff. Great. Okay, thank you, Lauren, for those comments. And now other board members, what type of questions or responses would you like to um, introduce? And go ahead and unmute yourself. I'm having, I only can see six people on my side screen. So I am trying to scroll down to see if I see any of you wanting to speak. Ah, Kathy Smith, thank you. Yes, um, I'm wondering if any of you have had the opportunity to train other paraeducators in the use, perhaps in the use of Zoom or any other technology. We know that um, paraeducators are hired throughout the year. And I'm wondering if any of you have been called upon to uh, share your training with others. This is Donna Hansen again. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Donna, go ahead, um, please. Because I'm the, the building's help desk, I do a lot of that, but it's very casual. So it's nothing that we've been asked by the district to do to other paras. It's been more of a just mentoring within the building people that uh, you see a need, you meet a need. Thank you. Um, Katie Lee here. And I would like to say, I have had the opportunity to help other paraeducators learn how to use Seesaw and Zoom. I've also helped um, a couple of gen ed teachers throughout their process of learning how to Zoom at the beginning of the year. Um, I, I've helped across the district and I'm actually working at two schools right now to, to kind of spread that out. So that's been very helpful. Great. Great opportunity to share your wonderful skills there. Okay, other questions from the board? Let's see, Lizzie has a question. Thank you, Lizzie. Hi, um, I was just wondering, um, cause I'm looking at some of the comments. Um, it sounds like some people are receiving um, in-person instruction and then some are receiving online. Um, and so I was just wondering, you know, um, for those of you who are just receiving online, has there been an opportunity offered, you know, by your district to receive in-person or um, are you strictly, um, you know, are you just, are you restricted to and limited to just doing online? I don't know if I worded that correctly. So Lizzie, is that question for the, the field uh, that you would yeah. like? Yeah, well, I was, yeah, I was just kind of wondering, because I'm seeing some of the comments and I didn't know if any of the paras that have spoken, if they're running into that issue or they could speak to that for, um, you know, I'm not sure if, if any of our paras that are on the panel right now are, but I know that I've seen some comments saying that some districts are, have only been offering online. And, um, and so that's where I was kind of wondering if that that was the only option or is that just because of now and later they'll get some in-person training, but just some clarification, I guess. Um, I'm Deborah Travis. I'm from the Yakima School District over here in Eastern Washington. And at this point and throughout most of this, we have been strictly um, in person. 
For a while last summer, the COVID cases in our county was extremely high. We were one of the highest on the West Coast. So basically our school superintendent um, decided to do only online school. So then any, any online training, or I mean, I'm sorry, any in-person training then was completely changed and canceled and um, online only over here in Eastern Washington. And this is Donna Hanson. Over here. Oh, excuse yeah. me, go ahead. Um, Katie Lee over in the North Kitsap district. Uh, North Kitsap just went back uh, in person this month, two weeks ago for special ed and ISP. Prior to that, we were um, all online distance learning. So now we are able to have uh, special ed come back in the building. Okay. Lizzie, this, did you have a, another comment? Well, this is Donna. I did have one. Donna. Um, we, we are strictly online for our training right now, and but it is specifically because of COVID. The majority of our training last year that we got before the, the shutdown was in-person training on half days. And I anticipate that it will be in-person training again as soon as, as soon as it's safe to do that. All right. You know? So let me ask the board one more time and then we'll go to hear from um, Zoe and Jack comments from the field. So board members, do we have any um, additional comments or questions at this moment in time before, before we take questions from the field? Okay, let me scroll up and down, make sure I don't see some of you waving at me. Okay, all right. So now let me uh, turn this over to Jack and Zoe who have been pulling in the um, questions and comments from our field, which I'm gonna speak to those of you that are on our uh, webinar right now, which is over 300 people out there. So we do wanna have a conversation and hear from our field. So Jack and Zoe, I'm going to open up uh, this opportunity for you now to tell us what are we seeing in the comments from the field. Thanks, Janelle. Uh, here are three that I would like to share with you that folks have uh, written. First, the training that I have been provided so far has helped me to better assist students and teachers in the classrooms in many ways. I was lucky enough to receive technology training at the start of the 1920 school year that truly boosted my ability to assist with technology needs in the classroom. This proved to be an even greater asset this year as students in my district have been in a fully remote learning model. For paraeducators to help students learn and grow in the classroom, we must continue to provide them with valuable training that develops them as educators and promotes professional development and continued learning. That comes from Isaac Fry. A second comment, the training has been a very viable resource. While I have known many of the items presented in the Moodles, the in-person training on equity really opened my eyes to the inequity that is rampant in society. I'm glad I was able to receive the equity training in person on March 9th, the Monday before Washington schools were closed due to COVID-19. I am using my equity training to connect more with culturally diverse students. That comes from Marie Presswich. And then a third comment, all trainings are worthwhile. Having them be paraeducator focused, i.e. taught from the perspective of paraeducators is key, not ones that are adopted from teachers. And that comes from Jennifer Thatcher. Great. So I think it is interesting that they, due to COVID, a lot of the training did have to be online. I think many of our paraeducators have already submitted comments that they prefer training in person. However, during the pandemic time, they did want to be able to use their time effectively. And with the shutdown of schools, a lot of paraeducators were able to take advantage of that time to do a lot of their training online. So, um, let me ask, uh, do we have other comments or things that the board members would like to reply to? The 
can. Okay, all right. So as I'm looking at our next component into the, our agenda, we are going to now hear from, we do have uh, two paraeducators. Did I hear somebody say, okay. All right, I'm going to move on to the next section and we're going to hear from two of our paraeducators and they're gonna be talking about how have their roles changed and what have they been doing uh, during our COVID opportunity and what things are they looking uh, to bring forward to us today about how, how life has changed for the paraeducator and their role. So the, um, what I'm gonna do now is introduce you to um, two new paraeducators. We have, uh, Jack, would you like to introduce Sure. All right. Um, thank you, Janelle. We're going to have two paraeducators speak for our, uh, a bit of a longer time on their experiences at the district level and how uh, COVID-19 is impacting their role and uh, their engagement with student, family, and community. We're going to have Laura Butler from Highlands School District and Brandy Strait from Kennewick School District. Um, Brandy, I see your image popping up first. Are you, are you with us? I am. Great. All right, Brandy, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, my name is Brandy Strait, like Jack said, and I work for the Kennewick School District, and I am a paraeducator at Kennedy Elementary School, and this is my sixth year, I'm starting my sixth year, not your, not your conventional starting for the new school year. Um, so when COVID hit, um, Last year, uh, when we started, when we had our shutdown uh, mid-March, we, as paraeducators, kind of had a feeling that our roles were going to change drastically because we could no longer do our job in school with students. Um, they wanted to make sure that we were um, still being utilized. Um, we actually, it was wonderful because we got to work with several different other units and we worked with nutrition services to make sure our students got their lunches and their breakfasts. Um, we had paraeducators jump on uh, the buses for meal distribution for our, for those kiddos. And we made packets for students who were not able to be in school so they could continue their education. Um, I would have the opportunity to be able to Zoom with the, the fifth grade teacher that I worked with and I was Zooming with her and the students. Um, I got to learn Zoom pretty early on, which was, uh, which was amazing. Um, we called parents to find out what the students needs were, if they needed technology, access to the internet and online resources. Uh, we made sure to connect with the students and parents to make sure that they had those connections with the teachers. And if they didn't, we made sure that they um, had those resources to get in contact with their, uh, their teachers. When we moved we moved from a regular classroom to a virtual classroom. Um, we use Zoom and we use Seesaw. Um, those were, we hadn't had any trainings on those as of, at that point. Um, we were just asked to, to kind of jump in. Um, I had a parent call me, actually a grandparent call me last year asking for help because her, her grandchild couldn't get in. So I was tech support for that grandparent for that fifth grade student to get online to access their homework and be able to do all that stuff. Um, at that time, the parents are actually also utilizing that time to finish their FCS classes and to do other professional development um, when they weren't um, on the buses um, distributing food and student packets and uh, food distribution. So fast forward to this year when we started a school year, it was remote learning for my school district. We had something called the Fab 50. Now, uh, there was a lot of behind the scenes work with the Fab 50. The pairs were enlisted to call the parents of these students who were able to get on this Fab 50, which was 50 students were able to come into a classroom setting um, from uh, kindergarten through fifth grade. We made sure that the students had access to all the things that they needed. The students were actually Zooming with their teachers. The teachers weren't in the 
it wasn't, it was a classroom setting for us. We were one-on-one -on -one with the, we were in the classroom setting with the students, but the students were Zooming with the teachers. Um, I'm losing my train of thought here. I mean, there was just so much going on here. Um, we had to do, uh, we had to set up temporary classrooms to accommodate those 50 students with the social distancing. Um, I personally did digital technology setup for uh, the kindergarten through second grade students who were struggling with the technology and, and trying to navigate through the programs. Um, again, the teachers Zoom with the students while uh, we were with the kids and we worked directly with the kids when the students were not on Zoom with them, the teachers anymore. Um, and at that time we asked, we were, we were asking to take training for, um, for these programs that these students were, were, were utilizing. Um, we asked, we did Google Classroom, we did Jamboard, uh, we uh, trained on Screencastify, Seesaw and Zoom, just, just to name a few. You know, we fast forwarded from the Fab 50 model, which was just the students and the paras, to the hybrid model. And when we moved to the hybrid model, we had our students on an AABD schedule. So we had half the students come in on Monday and Tuesday, and then the other half the students come in on Thursday and Fridays. And during that time, um, we as parents would still be Zoom support for the students who were not in school, depending on their schedule. And then we were also pushing into the classrooms to assist with the teachers. But we were also calling to remind parents during the hybrid model to make sure that their kid, the, they're completing the, the health screenings for their students. Um, parents are now asked, were volunteered to assist with what we call the paw pad, which is the isolation room. And what that means is, is a few people, a few parents are asked to be trained to, um, Oh gosh, how, how do I even put this? We were trained on the, we had to, what PPEs we had to wear when the students came down, when, when we got called on the radio, the student would come down, we'd take their vitals, um, we'd ask them what their symptoms were, we'd relay that information to the nurse and then have them sit in the isolation room. And then the nurse would make the, the call whether or not to send the student home or, um, or return to class. Um, there's just, there's just so much going on, you know, between the trainings and, and the t my schedule changed so much from what it was when I was a para in the classroom to where we are now, especially with the Fab 50. That was actually very, very unique, uh, very unique situation indeed, where again, we got to work with the students while the teachers Zoomed with them. But a typical day for myself, was now I get to work, I deliver breakfast, I go outside, I cover the front, the bell rings, I get in to my Zoom class with my fifth graders. I leave, I leave that classroom, I leave the Zoom class, we go outside and do recess because we have a hybrid model. We have our students, they, they eat lunch, they eat breakfast, and then they have recess, which is a little, from what I'm understanding, a little different from than what other districts are, are doing. Um, I'm lo I've, I've a loss for, I'm a loss for words now. I am Zooming with fifth graders for math support. And for the math support, I connected with the, met with the fifth grade teachers and asked them what they wanted us to do. Um, they wanted us to focus on multiplication, math facts and things like that. With the fifth grade uh, reading support, they want us to focus on um, comprehension, uh, narratives and, and things of that nature. And then with sixth, with second grade, I'm also in a Zoom classroom for another 30 minutes with second grade. Um, and this is also to help students with their, with their reading or any other homework that they have if they're um, doing either remote learning, only remote learning, or if they're part of our hybrid model and they're not there two days a week. Um, I'm sorry for my rambling. I do appreciate the time that you've allowed me to, uh, to, to share my story. And um, thank you very much. So Brandy, thank you. That wasn't rambling. It was amazing to see what unique support you brought and always the innovation the paraeducators do to support their students. So thank you for that sharing. And the next is we're going to move to um, Highline. Jack, would you like to introduce our Highline representative? 
Uh, sure, Janelle, thank you. Uh, we have Laura Butler from Highline. Laura, are you with us? Yes, I am. Great, thank you so much, Laura. It's all yours. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Laura Butler. I am a special education paraeducator at Beverly Park Elementary School in the Highline School District, which is located in Burien. Our district is, district is multicultural with a large portion of families on free and reduced lunch. I have 22 plus years fulfilling many roles throughout my career as a paraeducator in elementary school. In my current position, I am a special education para in an IAC, which is Intensive Academic Center, a self-contained classroom of students, and I consider it an honor and a privilege. I absolutely love it. During COVID quarantine, I made masks for our district employees and volunteers that were nutrition services, get food out to our students and their families and for paras, nurses, and other staff members who volunteered to do daycare for the first responders. Our district had a need for 300 masks because we didn't have any, and uh, I got started on it and had other people get the word out to several people, and we fulfilled that need for uh, our district. I worked on completing my FCS fundamental course of study requirements, uh, the clock hours for the para certification. Um, it was a great time to take advantage of um, getting those uh, taken care of through Zoom. I stayed in close contact with our school, the classified employees and our Teamsters bargaining unit. We were keeping each other on updated on what's been happening through the district, through uh, what the governor was having, having to say, discussions of being flexible in our duties at school with the many changes in how school would continue through this very challenging time. The challenges of COVID school through Zoom, uh, we were helping students, parents uh, and teachers, but we were helping students and families navigate through online learning making sure every student had internet and a device. And we also make sure we have connections um, with all of our students, so paras and teachers, but paras uh, connecting with students um, throughout the district to make sure that um, everyone feels connected to school. We have paras helping teachers on Zoom by tutoring small groups um, or one-on-one -on -one instruction in breakout rooms for math, writing, social and emotional learning as well. So, uh, we're helping teachers motivate students, helping them feel successful with the online learning. Um, when teachers share their screen for a lesson on Zoom, they can't see all of the students, so the paras are their second set of eyes and ears. We're checking assignments on Seesaw, but that's the program the teachers use to put out assign assignments for students to work on asynchronously. Monitoring students using a program called Go Guardian. This program allows teachers and paras to go online and see what the students are working on. The program you can um, with that program, you they um, if they are if the students are on a district device, you can go in and see the student's screen, see if they're on task. You can open a, or close a window for them. If they are on a site that they shouldn't be on, you like YouTube, you can close that out. Um, and we can also help through this program help students get back on track and continue their learning online. And we can also see their progress in certain programs like iReady, iMath. We can see um, how far they've come. Our biggest challenges uh, with is with technology. We've had to uh, to learn so many new programs and tools for online learning in a very short time. We need better and more intensive training and time to practice and apply what we have learned to have the confidence to do this work so that your investment in this in the FCS para certification program pay off. Technology wasn't a big part of many of our workday. 
with uh, our, uh, you know, with our students. Many paras uh, used shared computers to check emails and such. Many of us paras are older and not well versed in technology, but we are very well to learn. Another struggle is the availability of up-to-date equipment. Paras need equity in technology. Not being able to work with our students in person is quite the challenge. But as paras do, we push forward, and we do the best we can, and we're always very flexible. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Laura. You can see by her description, what a change to the paraeducator role and what a tremendous opportunity paras have had to really learn, to stretch, to grow, and to really make sure that they are doing the best they can to service their, their students. What an amazing testimony, Laura. I really thank you for that. And now I would like to open it up to the board to comments and um, share a little bit about your experience that you've just heard from Laura and Brandy. And so I'm gonna open it up to the board right now. And I'm going to go up and see if I can't uh, spread my little channel here to see if I've got anybody on the board. Okay, Kathy, you're up. Thank yeah. you. Wow, both of you. What, a, what an amazing sharing. I, I felt like I got a window into your world. And thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. I'm wondering about the social and emotional wellness of your students and your family. And I'm wondering, is there any uh, additional training that would be helpful to you that we could provide um, to um, ensure that wellness. Okay, an open question to Laura and Brandy. Your comments for Kathy. You can just unmute yourself. Hi, this is Brandy straight again. Um, in, in my school, our counselor was very, very good at um, making sure that we had access to the social emotional learning piece for our students that were in our Fab 50 and the ones that are continuing to be in our hybrid model. Um, when the students went in that when they switched from our Fab 50 to the hybrid model, the, the teachers continued that social emotional learning piece in the classroom, which I thought was wonderful and very much needed for our students. Okay, great. Any uh, other, uh, Laura? Yeah, in, in our school and in our district, um, social and emotional learning is, is very important. Um, at our school, we actually pull in three programs, one called RULER. We've used sound discipline and we also use for PBIS. Um, every morning, we have a morning meeting to start our day and we're checking on the students, how they're feeling. Um, and and a description as to why uh, we use something called um, the ruler mood meter. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it, but um, it has four sections to a grid and it um, has colors of red, yellow, blue, and green. And we teach the students red and yellow high energy, blue and green low energy, but different feelings of, are they good feelings or sad? We've had a lot of extensive training in that and we use it every day. And we've been paying very close attention to how our students are doing uh, during these times, cause it is rough. Um, our students ask if they can come to school almost every day and it's been hard for them to be home. And in many situations, it's extremely difficult on these families, um, having the kids uh, not go to school, having to juggle work and, and um, their students' school lives as well. So I feel very fortunate that we've had a lot of training in this manner. Um, yeah. Thanks, Laura. Other board members, questions for Laura or Brandy? Lauren? Yeah, thank you, both of you. Uh, I think both of you brought up in your, in your um, reflection about contact with family. I'm just curious if, this, if you saw a significant change in how you were 
connecting and contacting family and, and um, from what you, how you did your roles prior to COVID and everything going online and all that kind of thing. Thank you, Lauren. That was really, um, that's a great question. So from my experience, I think that uh, the connection is even more so because of, of the fact that we've had to isolate and these are people that I, we're, I'm used to seeing on a daily basis and now the connection has kind of been severed due to COVID. Um, but when we get a hold of these parents and talk to them about, you know, do you have this, do you need that? They're very thankful, very happy that we call, very just welcoming and just, yes, please, you know, just keep in contact. Um, that's what I've received from the parents that, that I've contacted and, and from my, uh, my, my coworkers too, they, they, they feel the same way. They're, the parents are really, really happy to hear from us and that their kids miss coming to school and, and uh, we completely understand why. Thank you. So I'm gonna throw this over to Jack now because Kathy, your question elicited a lot of comments from the field. So Jack, I'm gonna um, now have you report on what are we hearing from the field about Kathy's question around more training and what about social emotional learning? What have you heard from the field so far? Thanks, Janelle. Kathy, great question. Lots of comments have come in and I'll just read them out. Um, paraeducators need ACE and trauma training, restorative circle training for SEL. Another comment, my district does not allow paras access to Seesaw as it's seen as a communication portal to parents, but in the time of remote learning, it is now being used for K-5 student work. I am unable to perform the grading and assessment data collection and review assignments and activities as I would when in person. How do other districts do this? Another comment, absolutely, we need equity in technology. We also need to be part of IEP teams because we are responsible for delivering tracking, supporting curriculum and IEP goals. We could use additional training technology and self-care planning implementation for us and our students. As an extended resource room para, I wish we were doing just half of what Laura Butler is doing. We do no afternoon learning other than specialists. Not all of our students even go to specialists. And then uh, another comment, our district did not provide any training for paraeducators on how to use technology to deal with remote learning. However, they did provide training for the teachers and if the paraeducators wanted to, they could attend those trainings. The information to sign up for the training that was scheduled for teachers was not sent out to any of the paraeducators. They had to find out about it through word of mouth by other paraeducators or by a teacher. Paraeducators had to ask permission from their direct supervisor to attend a training that is not part of the pre-approved paramodule trainings. Some paraeducators were not allowed to attend the extra training on the technology. Hearing from other paraeducators from around the state in shedding light that our district is doing the bare minimum to train the paraeducators. Is there any, and, and then the question is, um, is there any way to help districts provide more thoughtful and meaningful training? And more broadly, if the board members have any um, suggestions on how districts as a whole can provide more training to their paraeducators, as it sounds like some districts are able to provide more than others. Okay, Jack, thank you for that. And now let's open that up. A lot of the field comments were, um, as we know, lots of variations around how districts are implementing the fundamental course of study lots of variation between how districts are using paraeducators. Really, we know that out of the 297 school districts that yes, we will have a variety of different variations on how paraeducators are accessing training and um, how they're being used to support the classroom. So let me open it up to uh, our board members to see if you have any, any comments around what Jack was able to um, report from the field. Board members, any comment? Lizzie, thank you. Okay, so yeah, um, thank you. Um, I was just, yeah, what struck me in um, the, the stories was, yeah, that equity piece around technology. You know, we talk about that um, with, you know, our students and that we're seeing, you know, this uh, digital divide. And I, I think that, you know, um, the point about equity for, 
um, you know, amongst just our staff, um, I think was, you know, I really appreciated that because, um, I, you know, we are running, you know, in my district into that same issue, um, you know, where we, you know, the, the teachers all have their own devices and uh, the paras, you know, had to check out some. And most of the time, you know, we're checking out Chromebooks, which didn't really, you know, they're not exactly cutting it. And some of the things that we, you know, need, some of us who have access to um, some of the programs, you can't actually access through Chromebooks. So now I'm, you know, waiting for a laptop. Um, and so, you know, so working from, you know, having to work at desktops and, you know, sharing some parents are sharing computers and that, you know, we had to use these Chromebooks because we didn't have webcams in most of our desktops. So, um, you know, I really appreciate that, uh, you know, that was brought up and that we weren't trained, um, you know, as far as the parents being trained in technology, that is something else that, you know, I think hasn't happened very well, at least in my district, it sounds like in some districts, um, they've done a better job you know, of training their paras on some of this technology that we've been just having to learn how to use very quickly and in a short amount of time. Um, most of the time I find myself, uh, you know, afterwards on uh, YouTube watching videos trying to self-teach myself uh, because I don't have any direction from the district or that the district, you know, I, our principal, um, she offered a, you know, a training for the teachers and then said, well, you paras can come, but we could only come for the first two hours. So that, um, that just seemed a little, uh, you know, like, okay, great, show up for a training and you're only getting half the learning. So that, that seemed to be, a, I felt there was a disconnect, um, you know, between, uh, you know, what classified versus the certificated staff are, you know, getting. So um, I was wondering though, you know, it sounded like, uh, you know, in the one district, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name, but that the FAP 50 were they, you guys were getting all this training on the technology. So how, you know, how was your district doing that and training you on all these programs and, um, you know, and how were you able to get that? They just, did they provide that for you? Did somebody ask? Um, Cause I'm wondering what can I do in my district to get that same, uh, that same um, training from, from my district. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Lizzie. I can't answer that. <laughs> okay, go for it. <laughs> so when it came down to what we were when we before we found out we were going to have the Fab Fifty, um, and we knew that there was going to be a lot of it's going to be technology based. We asked, what programs are they using? How can we get trainings on them? And they said, here you go. Our our principal um, talked to the. Uh, the people of the district office who provide the trainings and they grouped one, four, four different uh, pieces of training and then grouped it together and said, sit down and, and do your training. It was Seesaw, it was Zoom, it was Google Classroom and it was Screencastify. So it was a lot of training in one session, but we had a better idea of what we were doing at that point. And we asked. We asked and we asked and we asked and we asked. If the teachers have it, we need to have it too. If the students are using it, we need to have the knowledge to be able to assist these students if they are having problems. So we asked and we got it with, with, with great support. <laughs> thank you. Great, Randy, thanks a lot. That was um, well stated. And we're glad that uh, your district is, is willing to support paraeducators. I think as we've worked on our paraeducator initiative over the last six years, we, we do know that some districts are providing lots of training to their paras and some are not. So we have a lot of work to do with making sure that all districts understand and can um, provide training to their, to their paras. So as I'm looking at our next section, unless I hear any other responses from the board members, I am going to move on to uh, our other presenters and then again hear from the field. So um, Lauren, and you have Chanel. Questions. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, to, to echo uh, what Brandy and Laura were saying about the gaining access to the technology they needed and, and learning it. Um, same experience with in, in my district where you know we had to hit the ground running right after spring break and figure out on the fly what we actually, what as paraeducators we even had access to, and when we had access to it, 
how to utilize it and help our teacher to utilize it best. And so it was definitely um, a fast moving train for quite a while. And we're still figuring it out, even though we've, we did it for all of the spring. And we've been a, in my building where I'm at, we've been in a hybrid model now for um, since school started. So we're learning kind of both sides of it. So definitely good to, Good to hear that others are figure, getting it figured out. Um, but I guess for me, what it really points out too is just the, um, the possibility of some inequity across the state of how students are being served because not all districts are able to maybe provide the level of support that paraeducators need to be able to support their students and the staff they work with as best they can. So thank you for sharing that. Great. All right. Thank you, Lauren. So now we're going to move to the next segment of our paraeducator listening session. And we have um, four paraeducators who are going to provide some content. And this, the questions here, I'm hoping we can move to slide number 17. Okay. So here are the two main questions, and this is open also to the field. Number one, what has your role been during COVID-19? And question number two, how do you think the role of the paraeducator has changed and will change due to COVID-19? So we have four paraeducators that are ready to volunteer their comments about how their roles have changed during COVID. So uh, we'll hear from, from them and then we'll be able to hear from the field as well. And then we're gonna wrap up with some uh, comments from our legislators. So let's uh, start, <clears throat> Jack, with our first uh, volunteer. Uh, I believe you've got, uh, it's Deborah Travis, I believe. So if that is the case, let's go ahead. And uh, Deborah, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I am here. Okay, give us again the name uh, and the school and the role that you represent in Yakima. Okay, yes, Yakima School District, Garfield Elementary. And I forgot to mention before, I've just been a para three years this go round. Uh, 20 years ago, I was a para and the job has changed tremendously since then. But um, on my role as COVID, I think my, my, the other para educators have described that very, very good. Um, we don't know. Most in, in the beginning, it was such a scramble. The biggest thing was connecting with our students. We did not want to lose a student. And so we spent a lot of time on the phone making that connection. Um, our school, we got assigned to a teacher. Um, I'm a lap para, which means I work with the lowest readers. And I was assigned the reading interventionalist. And um, the so I work with students directly. We use Google Classroom. Um, the way that it has changed since COVID has been the, the biggest thing. The first thing that I thought of for me was it seems like to me in, in our school, there's less supervision. You know, it used to be that I was in a small group, pretty much in the classroom or really close to, to the teacher when I was doing my small group instruction. Now, um, our teachers, most of our teachers are not at the building. They are allowed to work from home. The paras at one point were told that they had to be in the building. And so less supervision. Now my teacher does listen in on my Google Meet, but she also has a special needs daughter that she has to attend to. So um, I think the biggest thing for me was a little bit less supervision and more planning. Um, I spent a lot of time planning, whereas before I'd walk in and the material would be ready. Now I have to keep track of it because it's all slides instead of in person. So I need to keep track of, you know, exactly where I'm at and make sure that everything, um, everything goes smoothly. So I'm out of time, unfortunately, but I'm going to go with a lot of what people said. I think there should be more equity between teachers and paras and equity in the um, fundamental course study, uh, the timing when we get the, when we get the um, 
opportunity for the training. Like I said, it was it was March last year before we had even had the opportunity to, to start ours. Um, I am very grateful for the board and for this opportunity to speak to you directly. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. We really appreciate your comments and I'm, I'm sure we'll have more time to entertain some conversation with you as well. So, uh, Katarina Allen from Bremerton, are you on? Let's see. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. There you are. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Katarina Allen. I am a special education paraeducator K through three for Naval Avenue Early Learning Center at Bremerton School District. And I've been one for about four years. Um, we have been in person since early September. Um, so we work with highly impacted students who can either not wear masks or cannot wear masks for very long due to medical reasons or sensory issues. Um, we still attend work every day, even though it can be a risk. The students can also have um, behavioral issues, um, which can cause outbursts that are typical. Masks can get torn off and face shields get thrown. We can get kicked, hit, bit on, scratched, or even bit. We also have students who are not potty trained and require changes, which requires us to wear more PPE to keep us and the students safe. We come into this environment every day because we know it's important for our students. Luckily, my class sizes are small this year, at most three to four students per day for only three hours a day, compared to nine to 12 students every day for six to seven hours. This small class size allows for in-depth and a more focused education. Sadly, online education wasn't working very well for our students since they are so impacted and require a more one-on-one -on -one education. Uh, some of our students actually have one-on-ones written into their IEPs. So um, we also see the students two to four times per week compared to every day, which is difficult for our students who are used to um, a more set schedule and the reliability that school gives to them every day. And that's pretty much how, how it's been going. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for sharing that and being willing to do that frontline experience face to face with your most neediest and uh, at risk students. So we thank you for your willingness to, to do that. Uh, the next uh, paraeducator we have up is Donna Hansen. Do we have Donna Hansen? Hello again. Um, as you know, I work in the Yale Middle School. I'm in the library technician because there's that one line in the bill that says and libraries. All right. Um, in the spring, um, I continue doing my job. It just kind of transitioned to working as a support role for parents, students, and staff. I'm currently our tech help desk and front line of defense for parents and students. Um, I help monitor a few students that we do bring in who um, don't have access to the internet at home at all. So they come in and they're in our commons. They're spread out. Uh, they're wearing masks from eight o'clock in the morning until 2.30 in the afternoon. Um, and we basically just monitor them. They're not students that are special needs students. They're just kids who are, are not engaged or don't have internet. Uh, I also have run my uh, library program via the online so people can put books on hold and then I meet them. I'm currently um, standing outside freezing, um, waiting for kids to pick up their books right now. I flex my hours. They're really good about that with COVID to be very flexible with us. I take time off later in the week to compensate for staying late on Mondays. Uh, I also, very dedicated, I have my office phone, which is the help desk. It does go to my cell phone. And I do take calls until nine o'clock at night. And then I return the calls using an app so that they don't get my personal cell phone number. My district's been really supportive of making sure that we're as engaged as we can with the families so that they feel like they're being supported. Um, and they've been very supportive to me. Uh, technology, like they were talking about earlier, is huge for our paras. The ability to use it and to know how to keep and get, or how to get kids engaged and keep them engaged. That's now our key function for a paraeducator in our district. 
instead of working with a small group in the corner of my library, they're now working in breakout rooms on Zoom. There's no physical books to work from. Everything's in a PDF form or online. I check out books to kids who have you know, struggled with reading it online. Um, we do have parent, we do have uh, pairs now that are in communication with parents, which is not the norm for our district. Usually all parent contact is done by teacher staff or counselors or, or admin, but we have paraeducators that are calling home and, and checking on kids and giving kudos to when they're doing better. And um, I think that uh, the vast, um, the vast majority of the kids that we have in our special needs, pairs are the ones that are working with them. I don't think we have any teachers in our building or middle school that are working directly with students. It's all falling on the paras. And basically the only teacher oversight is usually in the form of a Zoom meeting with the para educator in a breakout room with the SPED students and then special tutoring on Wednesdays. Um, and that's about it. Thank you. So Donna, thank you so much for your work and indeed, your role has changed and you have stepped up to the plate. So we thank you for that. Our last paraeducator is going to be Nancy Ulrich. Is Nancy Ulrich on? Sorry about that, I was muted, I am here. Okay, all right. Nancy, welcome. Would you like to share a little about who you are and where you're from yes. and your role? Okay. So I, my name is Nancy Ulrich. I'm a paraeducator at uh, West Mercer Elementary School, number 400. I'm also currently a student at WGU due to the love of my job. Um, I just wanted uh, the board to know that training shows that we are valued. Um, I'll try to be quick about my comments. One of the things I think is the most important in my job is to be able to reach through Zoom and capture the attention of the kids. So in the morning I work with kindergartners, um, I monitor, I do the breakout rooms, uh, they go in, they go out, I help the parents get back in. And then in the afternoon, I work with a fifth grade math class. Um, we also have a study hall that we do at two o'clock. And I have found out that um, one of the things that I try to do is to really know the students. We actually have a brand new student that I talked to the other day and I asked her, how are you gonna feel when you come in? She said, because of Zoom and all of my my classmates, I feel like I have already been to your school. Um, our school also has a reading um, group that does Limitless Minds, which I cannot give enough um, kudos for that book. Also, um, I've been able to draw kids into our study hall because they want to just do whatever they want to do after um, instruction time. Um, I've been able to chat with kids that normally don't say a word in class ask them how they're doing, invite them to the study hall, or it's called Parasport, but I call it study hall. There's kids that actually have come and said, is there any way, Miss Nancy, that we can do this on break? Can we come to the study hall? Um, which breaks my heart, but I don't wanna um, do something I'm not supposed to do. So um, I do a lot of the same things that other parents do, but I didn't wanna just reiterate. Um, I know in the beginning of COVID, uh, it was, Nobody really knew what was happening. I emailed all of the teachers in our school and let them know that I do not want to be bored. I'm a type A person. I have to do multiple things at a time. Um, but I have, um, you know, I've, I've, I've gotten closer to, and I do lunchroom. I actually manage the lunchroom. I do um, recess when things are normal. But I have been able to reach through the computer and get to know some kids that I never was able to get to know. Um, and that's just, it's very heartwarming to me. Um, so anyways, I, I wish I had more time, but I don't. Also, um, I've asked the teachers to please email parents and let them know about the study hall. It's a free tutor session, and there's actually been kids that come that have excelled in math now, um, and, you know, there's sometimes there's, there's gaps in learning, and I let them know, you know what, I had a teacher tell me that I had no logic in my head. I never thought I could do math and um, I'm able to bring them in with that experience. So thank you very much for letting me talk. Hello. So Nancy, thank you very much. Oh. And you're absolutely right around 
that experience of how do you reach through the computer and engage your students. I think that's one of the, the hardest things that paraeducators are sharing that they have to figure out how to engage their students. And so we wanna thank you for reaching out to your students and, and providing that extra, especially if they've never gotten to be able to express to you or have a, a relationship with you now through COVID, you are able to kind of reach through and, and do something that is a positive during COVID. So now that we've heard from uh, our four paraeducators, let me open it up to the board to see what kind of comments, questions, and then we will toss it back to Jack and Zoe to hear from the field as well. So let me go and see if I've got board members that would. Oh no, I can't hear him. Janelle, unmute yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I probably said all that and nobody heard a thing I was saying. I am so sorry. So now we're going to ask our board for questions to have a, a conversation, a dialogue with our four presenters on their role during COVID. And then we will toss it over to Jack and Zoe to hear what are we hearing from the field about different roles and responsibilities during COVID. So board members, I am looking at my screen to see if any of you are wishing to unmute around roles and responsibilities during COVID. Laura, thank you. Unmute yourself, Laura. Thank you. Thank you everyone for, for adding your information um, for all of us to hear. I want to say thank you to everybody who's talked today about the adaptability that paras have every day anyways. And it's nice to hear that we're still going with it no matter what um, COVID throws at us. Is there any particular type of training that um, you have wanted maybe since September, not even not going back to March, but since September that would benefit you in um, reaching kids while on, on Zoom. Great, let's throw that out to our Deborah, Katerina, Donna, and Nancy. Do you have any response to that question? What kind of training, especially in run engaging our students, do you think would be helpful? Um, Deborah Travis here. Yeah, just uh, unmute yourself. Great, thank you. Uh, just, just what we talked about, especially the um, social emotional um, training to me, making that connection, um, the area that our school in is very low poverty and very high crime. And a lot of our students are not safe at home. And school is a safe place for them to be. And so when we're in person, it provides that for them. But now that they are um, not able to come to the school, how do you make that connection? I mean, we, the social emotional learning is so, so important. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly how to make that connection. I mean, I think some of the, the teachers are awesome at it and I watch and I try to, you know, mirror what they're doing. But for me, you know, how do you connect? How do you reach to that computer and, um, and try to get that? So any type of social emotional, you know, how do we, you know, you, you know, for example, you find out that a kid, you know, uh, parents are working, they're home alone or, you know, whatever. How do you, you know, it's not a danger, but how do you make that connection? So for me, it's the social emotional aspect. It's the most important in connecting right now. Okay, great. Thank you. Other comments? This is Donna again. Hey, um, Donna. Along those same lines, again, um, we've already mentioned technology. I get a lot of paras that come asking for help on technology, but also the equity piece and, and um, getting a, um, the SEL and the equity, racial equity, economic, social, emotional, all that stuff. We just, we don't get it. If we do get it, we have to beg for it. And um, there's never, there's never enough. Okay, great, thank you. 
Any other comments, uh, questions from the board? Otherwise, I am going to throw it over to the field to see what's coming through from our attendees in the field. So let me go up and see if I've got any other hands up on the board. Okay, no hands up on the board. So let me throw this over now to Jack, okay, and to Zoe. Comments from the field, what are we hearing? Thanks, Janelle. Lots of, uh, lots of different comments from the field, some that are able to relate with what is saying and some that are not be able to relate with uh, what has been shown, shared by some of the paraeducators. Um, I'm going to read off a, a bunch of different comments that we have received, and there are several more as well, but we'll just start with these few for the board. All right, to start, I feel that our role has been incredibly important through COVID-19. It feels like paras have been instrumental in not, not teaching with the meaning of para side by side. I have been responsible for planning lessons, giving individual instruction, assessing, and tracking data. Another comment, I was a one-to-one -one para. My role has changed completely. I no longer work with my student. Now I am teaching a small group of students. I'm not reteaching. We do not rotate groups so that the teacher has a chance to work with all students at some point during the week. Another comment, yes, the role of the para educator has changed so much since I began in special education in 1998. I work in person. Our classroom is split between two different rooms to accommodate social distancing. My teacher has to move between the two rooms to support student learning. We are doing more work with the same number of staff. We do not have enough planning and collaboration time to prepare for this. In addition, it is nearly impossible to get a substitute to cover our job because there are just errant substitutes willing to work in person. We are stretched to our absolute max, but we keep showing up, doing the work, and supporting our students and each other because we love what we do and we are dedicated to our students' learning. Another comment. My role during COVID was minimal last spring. Now it is much different. We are helping online with Google Meets, with, with Google Meets assisting with them. We'll continue to be the support for the teacher in the classroom and the online students. A couple more. Not really a question, just wanted to share our situation. Last year, when we got shut down, it was very difficult. We provided breakfast and lunch to all and any kiddos that were 18 years old or younger. So we made up 300 breakfasts and lunches every day, even through the summer. As well as getting the lunches ready, myself and another para, we would get paper packets for uh, kindergartners through fifth grade. We would do this at school. The teachers would email us and we would get all these packets ready for the bus routes to deliver. We also provided our students with Chromebooks and jetpacks. On Fridays, we would, we would do 900 lunches for the weekends. We are, however, in school right now. It is very difficult for everyone. And then a final comment for now, but there are more. I find that reaching students does not only mean academics, but actually taking the time to play a game with them. I find the best way to make a connection is through play. I develop role and read games. Sometimes I take a moment to throw out a would you rather question. I ask for students' comments as to how to best learn through play. Jenna. Okay, great. All right, let's go to um, the board now for comments. Now that we've heard some of the <clears throat> ideas from the field, what types of, of comments or questions do you have from my four board members? Lauren. Well, it's very evident to me that the, the role and the responsibilities of the educator has changed demonstrably during the last few months. Um, it seems for me, just kind of thinking about it and reflecting on it, it seems reasonable to think that a lot of these changes uh, may continue going forward. And, and uh, I'm thinking, looking back at, at the different pieces to the paraeducator training, um, the general certificate uh, training that is will be coming up would be a great place for districts to be able to pro uh, provide this training specific to the needs that a lot of um, our paraeducators are expressing today and and that are coming through in the, the Q&A box and that sort of thing. So I think going forward, we have a good system in place. We just need to see it um, 
begin to do what, what it's designed to do and provide that support for these paraeducators out there. Thank you, Lauren. Other board member comments? Lizzie, go ahead, please. Um, I was just wondering, so, cause I'm kind of just listening to the comments and everything and what people have said that yes, uh, paras are taking more and more duties and responsibilities as far as having to actually deliver direct instruction and doing teaching. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, would it be helpful? And I, cause I'm not sure maybe, you know, if we, when we do return in the classroom, since now that we've, a lot of us have done these skills that maybe we hadn't prior to COVID have done acquired, you know, would there be some kind of training maybe that we would need to add um, about maybe some, you know, some methods as far as delivering instruction, some techniques that we could use that kind of stuff. Since it sounds like a lot of us are working in small groups and working with students and, um, you know, we don't necessarily have all those um, all those pieces that we know that teachers use as far as like scaffold, scaffolding techniques and that kind of thing. So I didn't know if that would be something like maybe an additional kind of class um, training aspect that you would think might be a good idea to add to um, you know the courses that are offered for to get your general um, paraeducator certificate. And Lizzie, you're absolutely right. Inside of the fundamental course of study, in many of our units, they did talk about scaffolding. But again, the fundamental course of study is just the basics. And then it was designed to allow for paraeducators and districts to then move to the 70 clock hours, which I think is perfect timing, Lizzie, as you suggested, to really go in depth with that opportunity. And that's how the system was designed. The 28 hours are just the beginning, and then the next 70 were to really dig in and find out exactly what skills were needed for paraeducators as we continue to, um, you know, I, I think we'll have COVID around for a while till we get the vaccine, but definitely we know that the real true necessity of completing those 70 clock hours with in-depth training that the districts uh, need to provide if they get funding is going to be an important component. So we've got just a one more opportunity before we go into our final segment, which is um, a Q&A with our legislative attendees. So um, let me go through and. Uh, Janelle, you, you're muted there. We didn't quite catch all that. OK, so. Um, <laughs> I am so sorry. I have, my mouse is, is really running wild with me on my little mute button here. So, okay. So we have um, one last minute before we're going to move into our last section with the legislators and comments. So any other closing comment that we would like to, to make during our COVID discussion around changing of the roles and responsibilities? All right, so let's move on now. I'm going to um, move to Marie and I'm going to ask her to uh, work on this one, which is slide 18. Thank you, Janelle. All righty. I think we're moving the slide. There we go. Um, so we are very fortunate to have some legislators with us that have been listening to all of these amazing comments that you have shared as well as um, written so verbally and in the chat. And I'd like to reach out first to Representative Sharon Timiko Santos and ask her for any observations that she may be interested in sharing or if we, we actually do have some time. So if there are some questions that you would like to pose um, and then uh, Senator Hunt, I'm uh, hoping that you might uh, also Representative Callen and um, Representative or Senator Wilson had to leave us but I do have a comment that she'd like me to sh share. So Representative Timiko Santos, um, 
I think you can unmute yourself. I think I did. Awesome. Thank so, you. Thank you so uh, much for joining us. Yes, of course. And I don't know if people can see me, but um, uh, I guess the first thing I'd like to say is thank you to uh, all of the paras uh, who participated today. Um, both those of you who are representing the field, as well as those of you who are on the paraeducator board. Um, I think many of you know that the paraeducator board has only been in existence for a little while, and we've been trying to, we meaning both you, uh, the PSB board and the legislature, um, I would say we're still in the early stages of uh, really settling the foundation uh, of the board. And of course, uh, many of you spoke very eloquently of the challenges that every person um, who touches K-12 education has been experiencing during this COVID. Uh, I can assure you that is true for your legislators as well as for the teachers uh, with whom I have also been in communication with as well as the principals. And certainly uh, I think uh, many of you know, uh, perhaps first and foremost, all of the uh, students and their families. Um, this is just a most uh, unique situation that we find ourselves in. And so the things that I would um, like to just touch on as some of the uh, elements that I uh, have observed and uh, whether correctly or incorrectly, I think they certainly do deserve further exploration. One of the reasons that we established the paraeducator uh, board was uh, a, uh, a cry that came to the legislature from the field around the need for professional development uh, training as well as a desire to be seen as the professionals that you are. Um, and hoping to do so by creating a um, sort of an official uh, channel, a recognized channel uh, by which you are getting uh, this training. Um, I think that um, in, in that respect, uh, it may be that you have uh, paraeducators who fall into two camps. Those who are longtime paraeducators and have no interest in doing anything other than being a paraeducator. Uh, and doing the best job that uh, you can supporting your students and their families and uh, the teachers to whom you are assigned. There also may be a camp of paraeducators who are looking for a little bit more. And for that, um, we certainly had envisioned uh, that the training that you're receiving as paraeducators should be and um, uh, really ought to be uh, aligned with uh, the work and the training of those who are going on potentially become, to become certificated uh, teachers. It sounds like we're still in this area of a lot of bumpiness in our uh, program and curriculum for professional development. I think that that bumpiness is made much more acute uh, by uh, being in COVID. Um, but let me end on this note and to say, um, the uh, COVID creates, I believe, an opportunity for all of us to reimagine how adults uh, interact with our students in such a way that we are creating rich learning uh, and teaching opportunities for everyone. Um, and so uh, I would ask that you, we use this as an op opportunity to start breaking down silos, not reinforcing silos, uh, so that, um, as I heard several of the paras indicating, um, they're taking on new duties. And uh, in some cases, more explicitly than in others, I hear you saying, you're taking on more of the teacher's role. Um, and uh, I, I really would hope that we do not use the COVID experience as an opportunity to um, throw darts at one another, but really to reimagine together and to work together on how are we going to reassess the roles and responsibilities that each party brings uh, to the table so that in the end, the most important individual, meaning the student, is the one that is lifted up by all of us. So thank you very much for sharing uh, with us today. I 
appreciate uh, what you do every day. I will just say my mom was a special ed teacher. She relied very heavily on her instructional aides um, and uh, her paras. Um, I hope that uh, in this difficult time that we will all remember to extend a little bit of grace uh, when uh, we've reached just that end of uh, our ropes. Um, and I believe that when we do that, um, we can all emerge from this stronger together. So thank you. Thank you very much for sharing with us. Um, Senator Sam Hunt, I think you just had a, a quick comment to share. I do, thank you, Marie. I just want to say, you know, thank you and hats off and all that to all the paraeducators who are doing so much to try to keep this going. You know, if we'd have given you 18 months and say, we're gonna go virtual in 18 months, we might have had a chance to, to take a deep breath. And I know there has not been that chance. I have a grandson who's a kindergartner and he and his mom are, you know, rapidly trying to keep up with everything and with the paraeducator and the teacher and all that. So I just wanna say thank you for going above and beyond and the, you know, we couldn't do without you and we do appreciate you and understand you. And uh, Marie's gonna write you an extra $10,000 check for everybody. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> but thank you anyway. We are hoping that the legislature will uh, will reinvest in the paraeducator training for an additional two days, but you'll hear about that in a minute. Uh, Representative Lisa Callen, do you have any thoughts you would like to share with the paraeducators that are with us tonight? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words. I definitely um, greatly appreciate hearing the wide uh, depth and breadth um, from the paraeducators that are that were on the on the Zoom or the, yeah, I forget which technology we're using at the moment, the Zoom today. Um, greatly, greatly appreciate that. I don't think there's a better way to really get a good understanding of what life is like, except for talking to those that are actually living, you know, living the experience and dealing with it. And I certainly know from um, being very connected to the school districts in my legislative district and then those across the state that the work that you're doing is deeply connecting to um, making sure that we're doing the best that we can for each of our kids. And there's just so much more that we need to do in this crazy, unprecedented time. And I know that your efforts, um, you need to hear it. You need to hear it on a daily basis. And I wanna make sure, I know you've already heard it from the other legislators, but I want you to hear it from me and you need to hear it several times a day that we're deeply grateful for how you're showing up and the work that you're doing to try to reach every child and try to give them their best chance during this crazy time. Um, finding the kids that haven't been able to connect, working one-on-one -on -one for those that need that, that extra support and time and doing everything that you're doing, whether it's meals, whether it's taking the time to do the training yourself, you know, so that you can show up in other ways and the, collabor the collaboration, the, the extra efforts that it takes to develop the teamwork, um, to work with your peers and to work with teachers and other education staff um, and the extra burden it's putting on you and your own families. And uh, it's just, it's all huge and extraordinary and you're showing up to the, the work and you need to hear the deep gratitude and thanks for what that means. Cause every minute that you're doing that means that, you know, there's that much more learning that's happening or you're helping another family through the day you're helping another child through today in the middle of this pandemic. So make sure you you take that on and make sure you give yourself grace and space um, and acknowledge that, uh, that these are truly extraordinary times. And as we're understanding that as an impact on everybody, that that's true for you. And I know as we work through what that means and um, understand that there's different levels of trauma out there too. And I think that educators and paraeducators are no different than having um, facing that themselves and having the secondary trauma of seeing those children that you support so dearly um, in tough situations. So I just wanted to make sure I, I recognize that work. And I um, this has given me a whole nother level of um, deep understanding on the training and the pathways um, that's out there for you. And I'm anxious to continue to collaborate to make sure that we can keep you in a successful pathway to give you what you need and the tools that you need in your toolbox to be able to do the job. So thank you very much. 
Thank you, Representative Callan. And, and I also wanted to mention that Senator Bob Hasegawa is uh, also on the call and asked me to share his appreciation. Senator Claire Wilson uh, had to leave at five for another meeting, but she said uh, she wanted me to share that she is very appreciative of everything that paraeducators are doing for children and families. She is ready to continue to support your work and your need and want for continued training. And just thank you so much for the invite. I learned an enormous amount this evening. So um, again, thank you to all of our legislators who were able to join us and thank you from me to uh, you, Paris, for sharing this information. It really will help us as we uh, look forward into this uh, next legislative session. So let me hand the baton back to Jack and say thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today. Great, thank you, Marie. I'm actually gonna hand the baton off to Lauren. Thank you, Jack and Marie. Uh, so you know what? I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Lauren. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Paulette, is, Representative uh, Jerry Paulette, is also on, and I apologize. I think he's maybe on a phone chat, or I missed him. I so apologize, Representative Paulette. We would need to make you a panelist real quick, and I think Zoe is probably looking at that. If you are interested in saying a few remarks and. If there are any other legislators out there, please let us know. Thank you. Jack, maybe you can let me know. Is Was that able to? Oh, he said no, thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> thank you, Representative Paulette. I'm sorry. Again, Lauren, I apologize for interrupting. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, so first I want to begin by thanking all of the paraeducators who participated in today's listening session, both verbally and through the chat box. And uh, staff has been collecting the things coming through the Q&A chat box from everybody. And uh, it, it has been a lot coming in, a lot of thoughts and a lot of comments. And so obviously we weren't able to respond to every one of those, but staff will be uh, following up as appropriate on those. Uh, your comments and feedback uh, will help advance the work of the paraeducator board as we review the training program and prepare for the upcoming legislative session. Uh, if you think of something you would like to share about your experience after the listening session, please consider filling out the paraeducator survey. Additionally, you can email public comments to the paraeducator board, which is reviewed before every public meeting. And I please do that. I like to see those comments come into our packets when we're preparing for our board meetings so we have a better feel and understanding of what is going on out in the field. Second, thank you to Representatives Callan, Gregerson, Paulette, Santos, and Senators Doss, Hasegawa, Hunt and Wilson for joining us today and listening to the paraeducator community. I appreciate the comments and reflections you had on what you heard uh, regarding the, the, the need, the evidence of the need for continued training for our paraeducators, uh, recognizing that, uh, like Representative Santos said, that some paraeducators see being a paraeducator as their career choice and we want them to feel successful and supported in that. And we also recognize that some paraeducators will use this as an opportunity to launch into a career as a teacher. And we wanna support that work as well. And also heard many of you recognize and reflect on the effects that COVID has had on the roles and responsibilities of paraeducators and how important that training has been and will continue to be to support them in those roles. And we look forward to collaborating with all of you in the upcoming session as we work through the, the needs of this. Finally, we want to share with you an overview of our request to the legislature for the upcoming session. 
first is to fund two days of training on the general paraeducator certificate and continue to support newly employed paraeducators with professional development. We are requesting an allocation of $14.6 million in fiscal year 23 to reimburse districts for providing two days of training during the 2021-22 school year. We request that the $14.6 million continues each fiscal year moving forward. And second, we'd, look, we'd like to fund the development of online learning to train paraeducators on community development. We will develop an online course to train paraeducators on how to provide support in student, family, and community engagement. As a response to remote learning, the online course will focus on addressing inequities to ensure maximum student support. We request a one-time allocation of $250,000. We do realize that the pandemic is causing financial hardship in the state which is why we are not asking for full funding of the program. We do urge the legislature to fund the program as we very much believe that the continuing training of paraeducators will improve student support and student engagement and advance equity in student learning. The role of the paraeducator is a profession that supports the teacher and elevates student opportunity. With further funding, all paraeducators in Washington can continue their professional development in assisting students with the most need. Thank you for all being here today. Thank you to our facilitator, Janelle Adams, and thank you to our staff who helped organize and run today's session. Have a good evening and a safe and happy holidays. Thank you all for being here.